Uh, definitely. Um, so my first uh, political system that I run into um, is the Internet Society itself, namely, uh, you know, CPAN, IETF. The stuff um, and these were uh, in 96 so I was 15 years old and I dropped out of middle high uh, because I want to participate full-time in that ecosystem also includes Internet Archive and ARXIV the Cornell thing um, Gutenberg project and things like that and for me that's my native political system um, and when I get my first vote um, when I was 20 years old which is just you know, five years down the line, um, is so ingrained in me that uh, it seems quite uh, literally true that I can actually take whatever I learned when I was 15 years old um, and bring it into the day-to-day -day political system. I think this is uh, very fortunate because in Taiwan, our first presidential election was in 1996. And so for us, internet democracy, not two things, it's the same thing. It's intertwined. It's literally the same year. I participated in the uh, first presidential election campaign using the World Web technology. Of course, the candidate I supported lost, but Anyway, that's lessons learned. Yeah, it used to be that in the 80s when I was young, uh, we relied on the journalists, uh, international ones and also Hong Kongese, um, to report uh, what's actually happening in Taiwan so that uh, international, like Amnesty International and so on, could support the human rights uh, movement in Taiwan. Uh, and so I do feel that the role is somewhat reversed, that we're now providing a safe harbor, uh, hosting the Oslo Freedom Forum, the Open Tech Fund stuff, um, also, the, of course, the reporters on Frontier and things like that and also through our exchange programs with Hong Kongese students. They're also given a neutral platform on which uh, they can voice to the international community without fearing um, prosecution or persecution. Mm, you mean what? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not, not at all surprised. So, so um, I was, uh, of course, part of the 2014 um, Occupy movement in Taiwan, um, the Sunflower movement. And later that year, um, many of our techniques um, get exported uh, into the Hong Kong umbrella movement. Um, and since then, it's quite clear that they're operating uh, with a, I would say, I wouldn't say adversarial, but uh, less than sympathetic um, communication infrastructure as compared to Taiwan, where the leading telecom provider actually volunteered to speed up the internet connection broadband that supported the Occupy movement. You can't probably find that in Hong Kong. Uh, and so it's a fundamentally different configuration, but I wasn't uh, surprised by the later movements, the, the Be Water stuff and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the the Shiba Inu. Yeah, wear 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 a mask to protect yourself from your own unwashed hand. Instant hit. physical distancing. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there's a couple of lessons. Uh, one is that when we mean humor, uh, we really mean something that's funny, uh, that appeals across all age groups and political inclinations. Um, so cute dog, of course, uh, cute cats too. And I myself get dressed up as Doraemon, uh, the, the the, the robot cat, uh, the Japanese uh, anime stuff, right? And, and these things, they, they offend no one. 
So um, all the outrage that could have been channeled to revenge or discrimination gets channeled almost 100% into joy, laughter, humor, and, and positive stuff. But if you make fun, um, with all due respect, the onion style, uh, then uh, that actually only channels part of the energy and actually radicalizes, polarizes uh, the other parts that didn't get channeled. So to be maximally inclusive, even childish at times, that, that really helps. Um, the, there's a, the Japanese have a great term for that, it's moe. Uh, the, the more moe you, you are, the, the better you are. That's the first thing. Um, and, and the second thing is the, the time uh, really matters. Um, if people uh, see the disinformation, uh, get infected uh, with the infodemic, and before they go to sleep, didn't see our clarification messages. It forms a long-term association that's very hard to counter with humor, uh, and could only be countered by inviting the people who dissent into co-creation workshops, that is to say, deliberative democracy. Well, I think trust and truth are not very useful abstractions. I don't use those abstractions in my head. Um, I use the abstraction of trustworthiness. Uh, and, and that's uh, a very different thing from trust. Uh, and, uh, and this is, has an uh, epistemic um, impact as well. right? So um, trustworthiness, or um, in a, a very kind of relational kind of sense, is the idea that instead of uh, getting the trust placed on any particular institution or even any particular person, the trust is placed instead on a process that is aligned, accountable. Um, it may fail, uh, of course, but uh, amidst the failure in an accountable fashion and fix the alignments by showing competence and things like that. And so the trustworthiness toward this epistemic input is relational in the center around one particular uh, behavior pattern. And so f through the l um, daily live stream, the Central Epidemic Command Center live stream and the hotline 1922 and so on, we earn trustworthiness with pharmacists and so on, with civic technologists on um, this particular matter of, for example, mass distribution or the cute dogs, um, you know, physical distancing. But it doesn't translate automatically to other uh, policy domains, even if it's the same person, even if it's the same Minister of Health, uh, because on those policy domains, we did not uh, establish the same um, epistemic uh, mechanism. Uh, and so the point is that instead of placing trust of truth or whatever to any particular institution, we need to make sure that we democratize um, fact seeking or fact finding, uh, which is, well, let's just call it journalism. Uh, and then uh, when we democratize journalism, just as in last year, uh, in our curriculum, we didn't say media literacy anymore. Uh, we stopped saying that. We say media competence, uh, understanding that the primary schoolers, most of them actually are producers of media in Taiwan Brabant human rights, right? No marginal cost in uploading gigabytes of YouTube videos or Instagram videos. And so because of that, then each of uh, those primary school students, if they participate in the fact-checking endeavor uh, that fact-checks all the different sentences that the presidential candidates said during their platform and their debates and so on, they become closer to the mechanism, the journalism mechanism that establishes the facts without placing any do um, trust uh, on any particular institution, be it the public sector, the private sector, or the any particular institutional media.
Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I've met the, the one of the architect of the Google Duo <coughs> um, chat tool. Uh, I don't think Google Duo is part of Jigsaw, uh, but it serves uh, pretty much uh, that role uh, in the use case you just described, which is pretty good end-to-end -end encryption without any application installed using just an off-the-shelf uh, web browser, right? It used uh, insertable streams in WebRTC to ensure that there's true end-to-end -end encryption uh, in groups up to, I think, 32 people. Um, and, and that is very useful. Uh, we're, we're now using Google Meet because we all reasonably trust each other will not interfere with the communication. Um, and also because uh, the jurisdiction you're in and the jurisdiction I'm in are in kind of a value-aligned fashion. Um, that can't be said to other places in the world, in which case Google Meet may be interfered, but Google Duo, the most they can do is just to, to stop its connection. Um, I, I've heard that maybe they, they are going to meet uh, together uh, into the Google Duet uh, or something, and then we'll have end-to-end -end encryption by default on Google Meet, uh, which, is, which would be great. That's actually the, the same kind of pressure uh, that we gave uh, four years ago, when I, the year that I became digital minister. Um, at the time, there's a popular chat tool called Line, uh, still quite popular, um, around this corner of the world, and they offer end-to-end -end encryption only uh, for individual to individual, but in group chat, it's not encrypted. It's like a Telegram group. Um, and so that actually has negative repercussions. And we basically said until such a day that you make the group chat end-to-end -end encrypted across all the different members in the group, um, we were not um, recommend, actually we recommend against the public servants using that tool, even for public communication purposes. Uh, and so around the, I think the turn of that year, uh, in early 2017, they changed the group chat to be entirely into encrypted other than stickers because they sell the stickers, another story. But anyway, um, after that, then we're, we're, we say, yeah, it, it's fine, it's fine. We can use it for public communication. And we're now applying the same pressure for other video conferencing um, software companies. And so something as simple as that, making a new norm, um, really the, the old norm, but uh, remaking the old norm uh, of end-to-end -end innovation and end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. I think that is one of the main things that a large company such as you uh, can make. And there, there's also the chat room. There's also the chat room. So, um, so like, there's a question and there's an answer already in chat room. So we have a side channel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Move, move, move fast and break the news. I think that's the tagline. Oh, well, not quite, but yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's practically, of course, very useful, uh, and the kind of infrastructure that you build essentially makes shadow socks um, less vulnerable or more resilient, um, and and I think it's it's generally saying a, a good thing. Uh, and from from what I can see uh, on the development, it's not just open source; it's actually quite openly developed and openly governed, uh, which is a pretty good thing. Um, so, congrats, good work.
Mm-hmm. 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 Well, cheaper smartphones, uh, that's a really good start, right? This is the, the smartphone that I use. Pretty smart. Um, Run, run, runs YouTube, so it's a smartphone. Uh, but also KaiOS, uh, which used to be Bluetooth Gecko, uh, which I personally contributed, uh, and and open source, of course, uh, and really, really cheap. Uh, and and because of the the KaiOS, um, this is I think a Nokia uh, thing. Um, I, I, I'm quite um, happy actually with this phone because it doesn't have a touch screen. I can't build addiction, uh, but it runs uh, all the web apps um, that I developed just fine because it's HTML5 and all that. Uh, and I think more phones like this uh, would be a really good start. Uh, and and also I think yeah the digital literacy slash uh, competence thing. Uh, I think people tend to think more about literacy when the internet communication they have is asymmetrical in the sense that there, there's maybe a high-speed download link or, or maybe download link from some particular websites. Uh, I would not go there. Uh, and uh, then the upload link uh, is quite constrained and limited or costs a lot, in which case is it just a reconfigured radio or television. Uh, and then, of course, you think about literacy. But in Taiwan, what we make sure is that even in the very early days of the like toll-free number days, uh, we make sure that there's like public telephone booths um, that was when I was really young, um, in the 80s uh, or before the 80s. Uh, even in the what we call the um, under-resourced uh, places that makes no economic sense to install those public library um, access uh, to telecommunication infrastructure. And so be that's because in Taiwan we have a weird um, constitution uh, that uh, initially not designed for Taiwan, uh, that uh, basically spelled out uh, that for the rights of communication, the rights of education, and the rights of health, these three rights uh, makes Taiwan a social democracy on these domains. It's only in every other domain that we're a liberal democracy. Um, when you swipe your, your national health insurance card, a single payer card, that's essentially socialism. Uh, and, uh, but if you swipe your credit card, that's capitalism. So well, what I'm trying to get at is that if you design the um, policies in such a way, for example, through creative auction methods, that we get all our 5G operators to uh, basically chip in a lot of extra money and then say, in the places that enjoy the least connection in 4G, uh, we set up the 5G um, experiments, those millimeter waves, uh, sandboxes and so on, in these places first. Not only do it attract the startups to that particular uh, place, but also it makes a social impact long before we figure out a business model. And that is the way it should be in a social democracy for those uh, fundamental rights. And in, in that, then, we will switch to a media competence instead of media literacy um, perspective. And it doesn't really require Starlinks or whatever balloons um, and at, at the moment. You, you can set up something like that uh, using something as simple as toll-free numbers and daily press conferences. In, in Taiwan, um, we uh, counter the pandemic with no lockdown, particularly because of those um, like live stream on television, teleconferences of the Quint, uh, the medical officers, and this simple number. Of course, there's chatbots and website and so on, but it's just a simple telephone number that anyone can dial in with a landline, even a young boy who said, you're rationing out pink medical mask. I don't want to wear pink medical mask to school. And then the very next day, everybody wore pink medical mask. Uh, and so the boy has the color that the heroes wear. And it really made a kind of fashion industry out of medical mask. Um, and so <laughs> the, the, the whole point of this is that people feel empowered just picking up a phone, dialing the toll-free number, understanding there's more than 95% chance it would get picked up immediately. They can ask to their heart's content and anything that the call center people cannot uh, um, you know, answer because it's generally a new idea gets escalated to the daily conference just a day afterwards or like my open office hours which is every Wednesday and so on. I can go on but the point is not high-end technology the, the point is fast iterative co-creation mechanisms mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, first of all, um, I mentioned the Wednesday meetings in my office. This is literally my office. It's a park. Uh, we tore down the walls. Anyone can walk in uh, and get uh, inspired by the public art uh, as drawn by people with Down syndrome, uh, very creative, and they get inspired to do crazy things like this um, pirate, sorry, uh, Mayor Stenik Ribbe of Prague uh, City. Um, they, their small cabinet just um, gets so inspired that they start climbing on this structure, which was not designed for climbing, by the way. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that none of them fell down, otherwise it's a faux pas diplomatically. In, in any case, what I'm trying to get at is that um, in such a open, safe, recorded space, people do behave differently. And that's exactly the case back in 2014 in the Sunflower Movement. Instead of the government top-down saying, oh, we're doing 4G development, we should use PRC components as people's of Republic of China regime, PRC components, or we shouldn't, or things like that, is the people going to the street, half a million people on the street, many more online, and in the same kind of safe spaces that I just showed you, um, basically deliberating all the 20 different aspects of the CSSTA, that's the Cross-Trade Service and Trade Agreement. And because the MPs were refusing to that, it gave a opening uh, of legitimacy theory that we just occupy the place MPs work to do the MPs job for them, because we elected them to, to do the work, they were on strike, okay, we'll just go in and do it ourselves. Um, and so because of that, the rough consensus on the street uh, has been very clear. Uh, there is no no pure play private sector company in a PRC period. Every time they want, they can plug and play leadership, leadership in the private companies uh, through their party branches or whatever. And basically, every time we adopt PRC component in our then new 4G infrastructure, we'll have to commit to do another systemic risk assessment anytime an update is done. And because this rough consensus is formed on the street and has brought appeal to pretty much all the 20 NGOs co-creating um, the Sunflower Movement's deliberative scene, when the National Security Council and the National Communication Commission adopted it later that year in 2014 and say, okay, from that point on, we're not going to allow any PRC company in our telecommunication infrastructure. And for the next couple of years, we will remove what were there in our 3G or whatever infrastructures. It's not controversial at all. We had that conversation, this whole of society debate on the street already during the Sunflower Movement. And so it's a non-issue for us because since 2015 or something, we, we've had no PRC components in our telecommunication infrastructure that's soft in the 4G era. Uh, and so when 5G comes, all of our five major telecom operators, of course, qualify as clean paths uh, in a clean network. But that's not because um, that they get a edict from the National Communication Commission or something like that. It's because people understood the issues, assessed the risk, did a large deliberation, which I would really help other countries to consider doing that. Yeah, and actually this uh, coincides with the question in the chat uh, that says, uh, in what ways do I work to defend Taiwan uh, as its own country? Uh, I, I don't work for the Taiwan government. I work with the Taiwan government. I don't work for the Taiwanese people. I work with the Taiwanese people. A very different uh, perspective. Um, because I'm, I'm a slashy, you see. Uh, while serving as digital minister, and I usually use the lowercase minister, <coughs> means I preach about things. So um, so uh, the lowercase digital minister in Taiwan, a, a poetician, um, I also uh, 
like work with uh, Vitaly Butter and Glenweil and, and, and Daniel Allen and folks um, in New York City uh, in the Radical Exchange Foundation. I'm also their board member. Uh, I'm also board member of Digital Future Society, that's the Barcelona Mobile World Capital thing. Um, and I'm also board member in the Council of Democracy Foundation, which uh, started from the 15M uh, in Madrid, uh, and then later on they moved to Amsterdam uh, and doing the council thing, which uh, includes participatory budgeting and deliberative democracy and, and all that and, and so by, by serving um, like just I don't know um, this worldwide I, I want to say global but that has a different connotation worldwide uh, coalition uh, of open um, technologists working on democracy as a technology uh, I, I see the Taiwanese uh, population more as the kind of people that embraces like early adopters of democracy as a technology uh, point of view but actually the parts uh, we cobbled together from all over the world. Uh, the e-petition system, um, more than half of our population in Taiwan uh, used the e-petition system, visited at least. Um, that's actually a straight adaptation uh, from Better Reykjavik uh, from, from Iceland. Our participatory budgeting portal uh, probably inspired heavily uh, by council, uh, by the Madrid people. Um, the POLIS system, uh, which is now its own uh, second level domain, like literally POLIS, the GOV, the TW, um, where we use it to debate uh, and deliberate slash ocean, that's our open to ocean policy or mountaineering policy or even diplomatic policies or the coronavirus hackathon with the US and other countries and so on. And this system, the Polis system started in, in Seattle uh, and it's open source. Um, and so the, the whole point I'm trying to make is that this is not about making something work for Taiwan and then somehow scale it out, That not that kind of thing. Um, it's this um, internet governance norms already proven and quite resilient actually as the internet norm package and how do we project in a kind of holographic fashion uh, it's to the day-to-day -day policy making re-express it in the language of the career bureaucracy uh, and in that we have many many allies the policy lab in the uk the gov lab um, in the us many many uh, allies and uh, i would consider actually jigsaw as an ally too uh, because you work on the underlying infrastructure that enable this kind of safe and free communication to happen because without which there's no deliberative democracy because anyone can impersonate each other if you're given the right root keys Yeah, um, so first of all, I, I guess more emoji, all right. <laughs> so uh, our, our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, uh, used a rainbow emoji, uh, and uh, there's the transgender flag emoji. Uh, I think it's also a Google thing uh, that's proposed to the Unicode Consortium. Um, there's the emoji um, restructuring that made all the default emojis, instead of looking slightly boyish, uh, just looks post-gender, and you, you um, have to add um, modifiers if you want to uh, make it look more boyish or girlish. Uh, which is great, uh, and, and I can go on, uh, but, but there's a lot of things um, that the internet companies can do in order to shape the norms. It's things as simple as, you know, um, putting the wearing a mask emoji 
instead of uh, like looking, I'm so sick, I'm wearing a mask, like looking cheerful uh, when I'm wearing a mask. It's the same emoji. I think Apple just changed that particular emoji to look more cheerful um, than sick. Uh, the the mask wearing person emoji, that's what I'm saying. Um, and, and so um, those are small wins. But if you do enough of those small wins, it changes the online discourse. It changes the norm. Um, things as simple as uh, putting all the reply buttons in a less visible places, that also changed the norm. Uh, making sure that in your reply input box, instead of uh, having a square corners, make it very rounded corners, that also improves things. Um, and so I, I'm not talking about like a very heavy handed emoji, like the, uh, like a speech balloon with an eye emoji that that I'm seeing you bullying people. People don't use that a lot actually, uh, and it's quite top down. Uh, but of course, it's a valuable conversation to have. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that just to make the norm uh, less discriminatory in the first place, making sure that when people they use the social media and so on, it takes them a lot of extra effort to bully, a lot of extra effort to discriminate. Um, and this is actually the way I use the term radical. When I say radical transparency, uh, I don't mean that I force you guys to publish your transcript if you want to. Of course, that's great. But it means that by default, I record everything that I said um, and I'm uh, with the intention of publishing it. And if I want to go back and correct a typo, I can, of course, do that. But it takes me extra effort. So open by default. And so. Uh, inclusivity by default. That is something that all the user designers um, can think about and then the user experience design can turn into human experience design. That is to say, care about the impact that your design has even when the human being is not a user of your product or processes. Think about how much they can convey this message that you learn from your design experience to other people to increase the R value. Because for if we tell the story of wear a mask to protect you against your own unwashed hand, it's very easy to re remind each other this. If you say wear a mask to protect the elderly, uh, to respect each other, that message actually doesn't travel very far. It's not an idea that's it's worth spreading, but it's not an idea that's spread. Um, and so just design the experience so that the tolerating message, the inclusive message, uh, my identification as homo sapiens sapiens and so on. Um, and that's all very easy to copy, uh, very easy to adapt. And so think about those in the designed human experiences. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, uh, well, Dao De Jing, um, to me, is poetry. Uh, it's one of the first poetry that read, I read as a child. Um, as a uh, child with uh, a uh, heart disease uh, that's corrected by surgery when I was 12, but before which I can't go outdoor or hike or really run or really get upset um, very much. Uh, and so um, Dao De Jing is uh, the, ki the kind of poetry that I don't need um, outside information to grasp because it talks entirely uh, about things that you can confirm in, in the room when it says, you know, hollow out clay makes a pot or cut doors and windows to make a room where the room isn't, there's room for you. Uh, that's very easy to verify, even if I'm kind of uh, in lockdown mode, um, like throughout my, my young uh, childhood. And, and so that's um, instantly uh, something that I really resonate with. And then I also read Zhuangzi and other Taoist uh, traditions and also uh, practiced uh, in the Quanzhen uh, school of Taoist meditation and breathing exercise and things like that along with my parents. So that goes uh, way back.
Yeah, it's a great amplifier, right? The authoritarian societies now have a more legitimate than usual excuse uh, to collect more data uh, and to uh, dictate more things uh, and so on. Uh, but the democratic societies, uh, some of them are caught in a false dilemma uh, because the authoritarian society were first to get the virus. So they get to set the international norm uh, just by virtue of being the first jurisdiction with that virus, right? Uh, and so uh, people were for a time saying that we either sacrifice some human rights, including, you know, the right to move, right, lockdowns, um, and also for the infodemic, maybe we have to take down something. So lockdown and takedowns uh, on, on one side to protect the public health. Or uh, we stand up for individual rights and democracy and whatever, and then we have to suffer the repercussions of the exponential virus thing will get exponential. Uh, and so it's like a dial uh, that people dial between the two extremes. Um, and so for much of the early um, March until I think April, uh, that's kind of the, the model that many democratic countries are thinking about. Uh, but of course, Taiwan and, and New Zealand actually but also um, other countries, um, start to show that this is a false dilemma. Uh, and um, the pressure that we get from the authoritarian regime's earlier norms, um, it, it's not an international war, it's just one of the first norms to emerge. Um, and so to respond to the chat question about the day-to-day -day pressure exerted internationally uh, by the authoritarian regime nearby, um, this is uh, actually, I refer to it kind of like a tension from the Austronesian plate uh, that coincides with the Philippine Sea plate and bump into each other and create tension, that's true, earthquake too. But because we are quite resilient, this also makes the top of Taiwan, the Savia, Pentagonon, the Yushan Mountain, many names, the Jade Mountain to grow two and a half centimeter every year because of this plate tectonic thing. So instead of uh, saying that we're dialing to the authoritarian norm or we're dialing to the, uh, you know, less as fact so many people die norm, uh, we, we bump into each other and then start a new norm that's basically saying we deepen democracy because we trust the collective intelligence at the edges. Because the social innovator in the front line up and including hostess bars and nightlife district know the best way to protect themselves to do a real contact tracing system instead of um, uh, absorbing all the data to the central FDA command center. So we come up with this heuristic. We simply do not collect any data that we were not already collecting before the pandemic. That is to say, we definitely said no to more data hoarding in the name of the pandemic. And, and that really worked, coupled with the daily press conferences on 192 hotline and so on. This builds this norm that takes care both of the human rights on one side and then the epidemiology on the other. And with a, um, I think, a much better show uh, to the economic side as well. Because when you do both sides right, that's actually the uh, enabling condition for open recovery. So I think uh, even our most hit sectors like retail and catering and so on, um, as of uh, September and also October too, they reached the highest revenue since the turn of the century in the past two decades. And our export grew by almost 10% uh, also in September. So we're thriving economically. And that's what this upwing instead of the other two wings, this upwing uh, attitude can bring you because it's um, what motivates people to think about economy, epidemiology, um, media competence, and things like that in a distributed, decentralized, and therefore much more wise uh, fashion.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and all go, goes back to the Occupy, the, the Sunflower Movement. Uh, in the Sunflower Movement, we learn from previous Occupies that, with all due respect, went nowhere. Uh, and the uh, agenda setting uh, power of the people is actually very elusive. I had a long talk with Clay Shirky about this. It's very easy to manufacture counter power. Uh, and that's actually some of your expertise, I'm, I'm uh, pretty sure. But to uh, manufacture counter power is not the same as creating true agenda setting power. And, and there's this almost impossible bridge. You can, in the counter power part, you can coach your jam all you want. It's actually very easy, actually imperative to be fun when you're culture jamming something against a dictatorship or something. Uh, fast, fair, fun, that, that's all very easy. But, but once you are in charge or nominally in charge um, of the counter epidemic, uh, both infodemic and the pandemic efforts, then of course what you're saying is true. It, it doesn't seem like the COVID is a fun thing. To make fun of COVID seems almost disrespectful of people who uh, toiled and died uh, because of it. Um, and so I'm talking about a very specific kind of fun. Uh, and that is the self-deprecating humor. And I'm not talking about anything else. So it's not a coincidence that our premier always make himself or his head or his butt, uh, the butt of the joke. Um, and, and that is because people don't traditionally connect a head of cabinet uh, to such a self-deprecating humor. And that is why I become a Dora Emon. You can check out the video later. Um, and, and so the, the whole point is that uh, the, the power that they, once we make sure that we relinquish this kind of top-down uh, worldview, the rest just flows from it. There really is nothing that prevents the internet people from remixing our image into memes anyway. So why don't we just foster it by, like for example, in my case, declaring Creative Commons license to each and every photo that I take, kind of deliberately turning myself into a meme uh, and uh, witness the very surprising, uh, like the rap band from Japan, those monos that just took my um, interview samples and make a rap song uh, about it. Like totally unexpected. I, I recorded the interview thinking that maybe journalists and scientists researchers will make use of it, um, or maybe computational linguists, but certainly not the rap band. Uh, but because Creative Commons is for everyone, so, so they really mix it anyway. Um, and so uh, I think we can leave the fun part, the truly fun part, and the fast and the fair part to the experts. But we need to provide the raw material. And we also need to uh, promise upfront not to sue them when they <laughs> remix our likeness uh, and then make funny memes out of it. This uh, kind of previously um, obscure way of coming out and bind to the social media people saying, whatever you do, I'm not going to sue you. Or the presidential hackathon where the president comes out and say, whatever you prototype in the three months, uh, five teams every year, uh, I promise to give you this trophy with a micro projector that when turned on, shows the president's image, giving the trophy to you. So it's very meta. Uh, and then we promise to make whatever you did in the past three months into public policy in the next 12 months, presidential power as hackathon prize. And, and so if you design this space like this, you don't have to do anything in between. That's left uh, for the experts to do. But you do have to become kind of a hollow pot, um, a uh, place where the people's creativity can be placed in. In due time, in due time.
I know. Um, my my father's uh, mother, my my grandma, uh, who's still around eighty eight years old now, um, is from a uh, Lu Gang, uh, a Taiwanese Holoc um, uh, lineage, uh, and her husband uh, came from Sichuan, uh, part of the Air Force, uh, and um, they married. I think not even three years after the February twenty eighth massacre. Uh, and um, which I think was something very courageous, I guess, because my grandma's family at that time said that they disown her uh, for marrying a um, you know uh, Air Force uh, occupier uh, or, or refugee. I mean, take your pick. But anyway, uh, and then um, and one of her uncles, I think, said that. Um, that there's no way that the marriage would last uh, more than three years, and uh, he gambled uh, up one part of his body. But in any case, so um, so uh, such colorful illustration anecdotes uh, aside, um, there is of course a very large polarization in Taiwan that I feel personally as a child uh, during the martial law uh, between the group of people who enforce the martial law and the group of people that was subject to the martial law uh, and. The martial law gets lifted, um, and gradually, freedom of press and so on started um, in the first presidential election when I was 15. Um, but still, the, the society, I would say, is even more polarized because of the <clears throat> freedom of uh, press and so on. Because previously, the, the dictator or the benevolent dictator um, can, can pretend uh, that there's no... Um, real polarization is just um, pockets of dissidents. You see all those rhetorics that people are using in the PRC, we used that 40 years ago, so we're quite uh, familiar with that. Um, and so uh, then, uh, but then something I think really uh, nice happened, uh, and nice in a silver lining sense, is that around the turn of century, um, um, September 21st, um, there was a huge earthquake that pretty much destroyed entire towns, uh, and people suffered a lot. So this is the, the story, um, I think it's also told in Lisbon, uh, right? Uh, it's a, a huge natural disaster that depolarized people because of this common urgency for the social sector people previously in the blue camp or the green camp to kind of uh, see no other option than work together to rebuild the post uh, earthquake Taiwan, uh, and that really helped the social sector to form. Previously, it, there, there's no idea of the social sector. Some people talk about the third sector around the turn of century, but after the earthquake, there's a real social sector going on. And once you have a social sector, you're less captured by the political narratives, the divisiveness that's almost always creep, creep up uh, in every presidential and mayoral election from the public sector. Neither are you captured by the kind of taking one side or the other um, tension uh, of the private sector, the economic sector. The social sector, almost by definition, take all the sides. And if all the social sector groups, be it co-ops, social entrepreneurs, not-for-profits, NGOs, and so on, have different sides, uh, all the better, because the social sector as a whole sector is plural in nature and is not forced to make four-year plans in a democracy, representative democracy, I mean. Uh, and so uh, once you have a strong social sector, these are the people who occupy the parliament. These are the 20 NGOs in the uh, Sunflower Revolution. Uh, and once you have a social sector, it, it's fine to be polarized <laughs> because you have more than 20 poles. Uh, I, I can always say, you know, I take all the sides. Um, if people ask, are you blue camp or green camp or whatever, I'm saying, uh, and my usual saying is that uh, I take all the sides and I identify with 17 colors and take your color. Uh, you, I can identify with any of those 17 colors. Uh, I even memorize it. Uh, that's the global goals colors, by the way. Um, and so um, basically that uh, the more choices actually um, takes people out of the binary, us versus them thinking. So instead of you know male female, um, there's you know LGBTIQA plus, and once the uh, choices become so many that it doesn't fit into working memory, it might as well be an input box. Uh, in which case that people can just be as plural as they want, and that's the way out of divisiveness and polarization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, it's interesting how they appropriate the, the words, right? Uh, the, the words 社会信用 or, or social credit uh, in the Taiwan context always mean radical transparency of the state to the people so that we earn the trustworthiness from the society, uh, not only to the government, but really toward each other. And when you say Xiong in Taiwan, people think about credit unions uh, and things like that. Uh, and it's very interesting, as in interesting times, uh, that how they reappropriate that term and makes it something that basically offers preferential treatment and shame its citizens with disclosure of violators' names and denial of high-speed rain's uh, travel uh, and basically become something that is entirely uh, totalitarian. And I say this uh, referring to the previous totalitarian pre-facial uh, recognition as only subtotal, like subtotalitarian. Uh, and nowadays it could be totally totalitarian, especially because um, in the central government in Beijing, they basically just outline this social credit redefinition, this ideological shift, and then each province are free to do even more draconian things um, as they want. Uh, I think um, Suzhou or Hangzhou, I think it was Suzhou, tried something like really extreme and, and face a backlash uh, from the social media there. Um, and Xinjiang tried something even more uh, extreme, but there's no social media there, so no backlash. Um, and so the whole point uh, of this totalitarian um, regime shaping, um, I think is based on predicated uh, on a very different narrative of AI um, as something that is essentially what I call authoritarian intelligence. Um, and when people believe in the narrative authoritarian intelligence, which surprisingly overlaps a lot with this singularity, uh, transhumanism um, point of view, uh, ex ex except of course only the state is transhuman, everybody else are still human. Um, but that narrative, I think, uh, leads to, to singularity and is singularly bad. Uh, and so that is the narrative that we're hearing uh, time and again. It's like a siren song toward more efficiency, better allocation of resources or whatever. Um, that's the PRC model. And the counter narrative that we are saying is essentially um, deliberately very humble. Uh, I say AI and I mean assistive intelligence. And assistive, like any assistive technology, like this glass I'm wearing or the hearing aid that my grandma is wearing, of course, by definition, is aligned with the individual's dignity that someone that they are assisting, right? And also it's by definition must be accountable to whatever the choice that they make um, in proxy of the person that they assist. These are the norms around assistive technologies that we already built anyway. And so by rebuilding AI as assistive technology, that's a pluralistic point of view. And I think in the PRC's case, most of the people that I um, worked with uh, on GitHub or whatever through, I'm, I'm sure, Shadow Socks, um, they, they very much uh, empathize with this view of not liberal democracy, but plurality and assistive intelligence. For, for them, this is more easily felt that if they have agency, if they can assist each other, this could be as simple as the original RMS, the, the Richard Stallman song, right? Join us now and share the software. Um, like, uh, holders cannot help their neighbors. Uh, like, like, these are almost primitive by, by today's highly evolved tech standards. But for people in authoritarian intelligence regimes, that particular polka song holds enormous uh, convincing power and showing that um, your current authoritarian intelligence doesn't enable you to help your neighbors. It only um, 
enables you to to snitch against your neighbors to deduct uh, their social credit so that you have a um, better seat in the plane or things like that and and that's you know cultural revolution stuff and and the people in the PRC really don't want to go back there uh, just like in Taiwan we don't want to go back to the martial law I don't think people in the PRC the citizens want to go back to the cultural revolution days or where people just you know snitch on each other and so on and so I think this very simple uh, delineation of authoritarian intelligence on one side and assistive intelligence on the other is something that we can work together as a counter-narrative that will appeal to people within the PRC. Yeah.